All right, guys, let's look at our part two of reproductive system. Like I said, in this case, we're going to focus more on pregnancy as well as sexually transmitted uh, diseases. And so let's dive in and finish up this chapter for medical terminology. All right, so the first thing we want to look at is fertilization to implantation. What occurs through this process when the egg is fertilized versus when it goes all the way and implants into the uterus? And so when we look here, we do see that the ovum releases the egg with ovulation, which you can see here. It then travels into the fallopian tube. As it's traveling through the fallopian tube, fertilization is going to potentially take place. If fertilization takes place, we now have a new a new set of or a new cell of an organism called a zygote because we have the combination of the egg and the sperm DNA which gives us a new individual. So the zygote then is going to go through the process of starting to divide. It goes into its two cell stage that happens within 36 hours of fertilization. Within 48 hours we see that there are four cells. In two and a half days there's eight. We see the moral stage, which is after three days, the blastocyst stage after five, and by this time, the blastocyst should be close to the uterus, and it should be ready, ready to implant into the endometrium. The blastocyte begins implantation about seven days after fertilization. Okay, so about seven days after fertilization, it should be implanted into the actual uterus. Now, the embryo receives nourishment from the glycogen secreted by the endometrium because the umbilical cord does not just completely just uh, magically appear. It has to grow through the process. So once it implants, it does get nourishment from that glycogen. It is during the embryonic stage that all of the organ systems do form. So this is the very early stage where the baby is also super, super small. All the organs are, fall, are going to be formed during this stage. And so this is a very critical time of development, but this is also the time that women don't always know that they're pregnant. Okay, and so this is going to be also when this blastocyte, when it implants, it's going to also start releasing that hormone that is detected in the pregnancy test. So this is what we see from when fertilization takes place to implantation, which takes about seven days. Once implantation occurs and the development then continues of the child as it goes through this process, we do see two extra embryonic membranes that form. These are besides the embryo, there's two membranes that are going to form. This is the this is the amnion and the chorion. They surround the embryo. The amnion and the chorion are membranes that provide protection by surrounding the embryo with also a substance called the amniotic fluid. Although the amniotic has the same meaning as an amnion has the same meaning as amniotic, the latter is more commonly used. We use amniotic more often. We also see that with these two membranes, they are going to offer that sac that the baby then is growing in. We're also going to see a special organ that is going to attach to this sac where the umbilical cord is going to come through, and this is called the placenta. The placenta is formed in the embryonic stage. It's a highly vascular structure that nourishes the developing fetus. This is where the oxygen and nutrients are going to be exchanged. This is also where antibodies from the mom travel to the baby too to offer protection. We do see that maternal means it comes from the mother. So this is the mother's side of the blood versus the fetuses. These membranes normally keep the fetal and maternal blood separated. They don't actually mix until childbirth takes place. Then there's a mixing that does occur due to the kind of pooling of the placenta. The placenta also secretes large amounts of progesterone, the hormone that helps maintain pregnancy. And so this hormone is responsible for making sure the uterus stays healthy and strong and, and giving what it needs in order for pregnancy to be sustained. If progesterone levels drop because the placenta is not making them, the pregnancy then is going to be aborted and we call that a natural miscarriage. After the baby's born, we also see that the placenta has to be removed. This is going to be considered what we call the afterbirth. So the sac as well as the placenta then also is released from the mother after the baby is born. So amnii, or amnio is here, a cordoid, fido is talking about the fetus. Secondip means second, and then we also have blast, which is embryonic or immature. So these are some terms that you're used in this stages of pregnancy and reproduction. 
So let's talk a little bit about contraception. Um, this is ranging from the most effective to the least effective examples listed here. Um, so this is going to help prevent pregnancy from occurring when we're talking about contraception. Now, obviously, abstinence is the only way that it's 100% sure that pregnancy is not going to take place. However, sometimes then medication or different barriers may be used to help prevent pregnancy. So one of the most effective besides abstinence, because again, we talked about it being the most effective, is going to be the subdural implant. Um, this is where a capsule is implanted under the skin and it slowly releases hormones. Um, these capsules normally a lot of times will go in the arm. The problem is, is if those capsules get ruptured during an accident or something like that, it releases all the hormones at once and that could be a problem. We then have the oral contraceptive, which is what we would call the pill. And this one you have to be really careful because you got to make sure that you take it at the, the same time all the time. You don't skip any and it can be affected by antibiotics if you're taking that. We then have the diaphragm. The diaphragm is going to be a rubber cup that covers the uterine cervix. It's inserted in and it covers the cervix to prevent. Sometimes these diaphragms also have a spermatocyte to them, which would kill the sperm. Um, a male condom is going to be worn on the male. And in this case, it's going to be a barrier that stops the sperm from even entering and it stays within the condom. We also have vaginal spermicide. This is kind of a foam or cream that's inserted inside the vagina before intercourse, and it is going to have a chemical that helps kill the sperm. But again, this is from most effective to least effective, so the vaginal spermicide is not that effective compared to other types of contraception. And there's a table in your textbook that shows you these and talks about some that even fall in between some of these categories. All right, so some terms that come into play when we talk about pregnancy and childbirth. We have NATO, which is going to be birth. We have parto, which is going to pertain to bearing offspring. Uh, tert, which is going to be ter uh, third. This is like tertiary or third. Uh, pseudo is false. Uh, Cesis is pregnancy. Gravata is pregnant female. Para is a woman who has given birth, and tropin is that which stimulates. And so we're going to see some of these kind of go together. So we'll look at these in, on our next slide when we look at some of the pregnancy terminology. So some examples when we look here, we have amniorexis, which means rupture of the amnion. Amniorexis occurs before the child is born and sometimes is the mother's first sign of impeding labor. And so this a lot of times is we would say, oh, our water broke. Okay, the sac actually kind of like opens, breaks, and the water, the amniotic fluid then comes out. Another term we see is quickening. Quickening is the first recognizable movements of the fetus in the uterus. This occurs around 18 to 20 weeks in the first pregnancy and slightly sooner in subsequent pregnancies because you know what it feels like. So the first time around, you're not real sure, so you don't necessarily recognize it until about 18 to 20 weeks, but it's where you actually can feel the child moving. It's recognizable movements. It's kind of like jumpings, kickings, things like that. Um, we see parturition is actually birth. The birth of the baby is called parturition. We have dilation. When we look at dilation, this is going to be where we see the actual labor process taking place. And the cervix is going to start to dilate. Cervical dilation is that enlargement in diameter. And we are working up to 10 they're looking up to 10 centimeters of dilation. And so a lot of times they come in, they check and you're like, oh, you're out of six. It's saying you're at six centimeters dilated. It needs to be all the way to a 10 for labor then to complete and the baby be born. Another term that deals with the idea of delivery is not just the dilation, it's the effacement. Um, this is the shortening and thinning of the cervix during labor. The term describes how the constrictive neck of the uterus starts to be obliterated or effaced. It gets removed. When this occurs, occurs we see that the woman loses their mucus plug that gets dislodged. It comes out. And so, again, this, this helps with the opening of the baby being able to come through the birth canal. We then have antenatal or antepartum. This is going to be where it is before so prenatal is another term for this and it means before the birth it refers to the time before the, the like when you find out you're pregnant or when fertilization and implantation takes place all the way up to actual birth 
postpartum is after childbirth. Okay, so antenatal, antepartum is before birth, postpartum is after birth. Now, gravad means pregnant, and so gravadia refers to a pregnant female or a pregnant woman. If a female is gravid, she is pregnant. The female may, may be identified more specifically as gravada one, two, three, and this just tells you if it's their first time being pregnant, their second, or their third. Another term can be preemie. Prima gravata is going to be the first pregnancy. If we have a multi gravata, this means that they have had multiple or many pregnancies. Now the para is going to deal with actually giving birth. Okay, so gravata is pregnant, but para deals with birth. And so they can have multiple pregnancies, but they may not have the same number of births. Okay, so the para one, two, three, four is talking about the number of pregnancies that actually resulted in births. Okay, uh, so the, the prima para means the first one, bipara means two, tripara means three, so on. Okay, as you're going down. Now, nilipara means that they've had none. So this could be that they have mold, they've had pregnancies, but no actual successful live births with viable offspring. Okay, and so these are going to be some terms that are going to be present here. So let's talk a little bit about the stages of labor. So there are four stages of labor. The first stage is going to be, now, now let's clarify this. These stages are going to be for vaginal delivery. Okay, if it's a C-section, you're obviously not going to go through all these stages. Or, heaven forbid, you went through these stages and then you still had to have a C-section. Okay, so you didn't get all the way through all of them and you were already tired and exhausted. But when we're looking, here are the stages. So the first stage is the cervical dilation. This begins with the onset of the regular uterine contractions and it ends when the cervix opening is completely dilated to the 10. Okay, and so that's the main part of labor, and it's the longest part of the labor that takes place. Then we have stage two. Stage two is the expulsion. This extends from the end of the first stage until complete expulsion of the infant. This is the pushing stage, that you actually push the child out. So during the expulsion stage, we do see the amniotic sac ruptures. We may have to rupture it where they actually pop the sac itself before they bring the baby out. This is also where the fetal head then turns in order to pass through the vaginal opening. And the baby should be coming head first. That's the, that's the best and safest way for the baby to be delivered. The third stage is the placental stage. This extends from the expulsion of the child, the child's already been born, until the placenta is then also delivered in a sense. This is where we expel the placenta along with the amnion and those structures. The fourth stage is the postpartum. This is an hour or two after delivery, and this is when uterine tone is established. So the uterus is starting to contract and go back down. So guys, those contractions, they start really, in, they start really low, not very intense, and build their way up. And then they have to go back down slowly. They don't just stop once the baby's born. So this postpartum part is when we're going to see that the uterus starts to calm down okay, after the birth. Some diagnostic tests when we're talking about pregnancy, we have an amniocentesis. This is a surgical procedure in where we put a needle through and collect some of the amniotic fluid. This amniotic fluid then goes to the lab for analysis. Um, this procedure is usually performed to aid in assessment of fetal health, a diagnosis of certain genetic dis defects or abnormalities that may be present. It allows us to also collect some of the fetal cells so that they can look at it biochemically and cytologically um, to get a good idea of what's going on with that baby. We also have the cryonic villus or villi sampling. These are tiny finger-like expression ex projections of the chorion that infiltrate the endometrium and help with the placenta, informing the placenta. This sampling is going to be looking at the placental tissue and seeing how good the placenta is. Look for any potential genetic defects. This can be performed anywhere between week eight to 12 of the pregnancy. And so this is another way to look a lot of times for genetic screening. Um, the human chorionic gonadotropin test or HCG, this is what we would test for pregnancy tests, whether it's the blood or the urine, um, to determine if pregnancy is um, taking place.
Okay, so we also have the cephalopelvic disproportion, which is CPD. This is a condition in which the baby's head is too large to pass through the mother's birth canal. Um, this could be too, the mother is too petite or small, the baby is too large. There's a disproportion, disproportion between the opening and the baby's head. And so cesarean delivery would be necessary in this case. We also have electronic fetal monitoring or E. FM. This is where they put the fetal monitor. This can be either inside or outside of the body. A lot of times it's outside. They put the little monitor and they wrap it around the mother. Uh, this is where they can look for the fetal heartbeat. They can watch for contractions. Um, they can go through that process of really monitoring that baby because sometimes the baby can go into fetal distress um, when this occurs, like when contractions are getting too intense, things like that. They would want to monitor this and watch to see if an emergency C-section may need to take place. Um, so some pregnancy path pathologies that we want to take a look at. Um, we have the abrupto placentae. This is going to be a separation of the placenta from the uterine wall after 20 weeks or more. And it happens sometimes during labor as well. It often results in severe hemorrhaging for the, fe for the mother. Uh, fetal death results if this is complete separation um, of the placenta from the uterine wall. So a C-section is required to to try to save the child in this case, um, but also to help control the hemorrhaging that is happening for the mother. A labor and normal delivery may be possible if it's only a partial separation that occurs. The next one's atopic pregnancy. This is whenever a fertilized ovum implants anywhere other than the uterus, and it's normally going to be in the fallopian tube. Um, if it implants in that fallopian tube, it's also known as a tubal pregnancy. This could be called an extra uterine pregnancy as well because it's outside of the uterus. This can happen in, again, various places. It could happen as far as the ovary, the uterine, even, even the abdominal cavity. Um, it could occur. Uh, but these are going to be where the implantation takes place anywhere other than the uterus. We also have hemolytic disease of the newborn. This is also known as erythroblastosis fatalis. In this case, this is going to be a type of anemia for the baby. Um, it's characterized by premature destruction of the red blood cells, and this results from the maternal fetal blood group incompatibility. So this means that, remember we talked about the placenta is where a lot of the exchange happens for the good stuff, like the oxygen and the food, but then the waste products as well. We also talked about how antibodies could go across the placenta. This creates a problem, though, if the mother's antibodies then attack the baby. Um, this happens a lot of times if the mother is Rh negative and the baby is Rh positive. And so it can cause the baby's red blood cells to be destroyed, and it could cause death in very severe cases. All right, and so this is a kind of a big deal, and so we watch for this. And this, this is something we've learned, that a woman... She had first pregnancy just fine, but she was negative and the baby was positive. And then the other pregnancies that she had afterward, they didn't, they didn't last. She had miscarriage after miscarriage. This happens because the antibodies from the mom then start passing through the placenta because they recognize that the positive should not be there. We have a way to overcome this where we give Rogam shots in order to borrow the antibodies. And so that way the mother's body doesn't make memory cells against the babies. And so this is a big deal of big advancement that has actually helped women carry that are RH negative carry on with more pregnancies. Another one is placenta previa. This is a condition in which the placenta is implanted abnormally in the uterus. And so it gets impinged on, it covers the internal um, opening of the cervix. Um, and so this is one of the most common reasons for painless bleeding in the last trimester. Um, because the placenta is in the way, you're not able to give normally normal birth because it could cause a, a lot of hemorrhaging to occur. So C-section is going to be the way if placenta previa is taking place. The last one on here is preeclampsia. Preeclampsia is one of several complications that can happen during pregnancy. This condition is characterized by the onset of acute, very high blood pressure. Um, anywhere from the 24 weeks of gestation um, towards delivery. Um, there also will be lots of protein in the urine in this cases. It may progress to what we call eclampsia. So preeclampsia is before it happens. Eclampsia is when we actually see that it is a problem. This is the gravest form of pregnancy-induced high blood pressure. Eclampsia is characterized by seizures, coma, 
high blood pressure, a proteorrhea, so protein in the urine, and edema. It leads to convulsions and it could lead to death if left untreated. Um, I actually had this with both of my girls, but my first one especially, my blood pressure was 180 over 120, but I felt good and that was what was real scary and bad. Um, my blood or my blood pressure was so high that it caused a blood clot to form in my placenta and it got dislodged. It didn't come to me because if I would have gotten it, then me and the baby would have died, but it went to my daughter. She ended up having a stroke in utero due to this preeclampsia and eclampsia that took place. And so this is a very scary thing and I ended up having, a, having to have an emergency C-section at right at 32 weeks of gestation. Well, almost 33 weeks, let me rephrase that. It was 32 weeks and six days whenever she was born. Um, the next one we're gonna look at is surgical and therapeutic interventions that can happen um, for pregnancy. Um, so the word, when we're talking about here, amniotomy is what we're looking at. And when you're looking at tommy, it means like incision of the amnion. And this is like a deliberate rupture of the amniotic sac. And this can happen due to like where you want to try to induce labor. It could happen on accident um, where this may occur, where they were doing a manual exam and they ended up doing this um, not on purpose, but normally it's on purpose to progress labor. That's what they end up doing. An epsostomy is going to be a surgical procedure in which an incision is made in the female perineum to enlarge her vaginal opening for delivery. Um, if tearing looks like it might take place, they'll actually do a surgical incision and cut because that's easier to fix with stitches than if it rips or tears. And that can occur if a baby is very large and the woman is pretty small and it could cause extra hemorrhaging to it occur. Um, in vitro fertilization is also known as IVF. This is a method of fertilizing the ova outside of the body by collecting mature ova. So we allow the ova to mature in the ovaries and then we extract them out. We then fertilize them in a kind of like a Petri dish and then we want to then try to implant them back into the female. All right, and so that implantation back into the female then hopefully it will take and allow for pregnancy. This happens a lot of times for individuals who have fertility issues. Um, the next one is suturing of the abdominal wall, which is laparography. Um, this is gonna be where the abdominal wall is incised. It may be sutured back or stapled together. And this would happen a lot of times when we're talking about a C-section. You cut through those abdominal wall layers and we then have to suture them back up. Another one is oxytocin. Oxytocin is a hormone. This is produced by your pituitary gland and it stimulates uterine contractions and labor to take place. Now, oxytocin is also used to induce labor. If they're not going into labor like they should, it could be used to induce labor. It also is going to um, be known a lot of times as pitocin. All right, but oxytocin is that hormone you're using here. Now, other drugs like uterine relaxants can slow or stop labor if you go into labor too soon, um, but that's just looking at the opposite where we're not inducing it, we're trying to slow down or stop the labor, but oxytocin's already being released by your body. All right, so that's ending up with pregnancy. Let's kind of switch gears a second and let's talk about sexually transmitted diseases. Um, these are known as STDs or even STIs so for sexually transmitted infections. Another term that's used sometimes is venereal disease or what they call VD. These are usually caused by infectious organisms that have been passed from one person to another through either anal, oral, or vaginal intercourse. Okay, so it can happen in all three different ways. Um, some of the organisms um, that cause STDs are transmitted only through sexual intercourse, but others can be transmitted through blood or needles as well. So some of these can also be given to you through blood or needle contact and not just sexual intercourse. We also see some intrauterine transmission can happen between mother and fetus in some cases. Um, or infection of the infant after birth as they pass through the birth canal, where they come in contact with the STD as they pass through the birth canal. Now, different STDs are caused by specific types of viruses, bacteria, protozoa, fungi, and parasites. And so you can see them here. There's bacterial, viral, protozoan, fungal, and parasitic. Um, when we're looking at these without treatment, a lot of these will contribute to things like infertility, atopic pregnancies, they could cause cancer, and they could result in death if left again untreated. Not all, but some can be severe like that. So let's take a quick look at some of the more common types of STDs in each of these categories. Um, so bacterial STDs, these can be treated a lot of times with um, antibiotics. 
Uh, but gonorrhea is caused by a gonococcus, a gram-negative intracellular diplococcus bacteria. That's a lot of stuff to break down. Um, gram-negative tells you it's going to stain in a pinkish color. It also has a cell wall that is going to be uh, thinner with some fat layers. Intracellular tells you it has to get inside of your cells. And diplococcus means that they are round and they're like two round ones put together. That's the diplo two coccus. Um, so when we're looking here, this gonorrhea causes heavy urethral discharge in men, but in women, it may be actually asymptomatic, which creates a potential issue because then they're passing it on without realizing that they are. The disease can usually be treated with penicillin or other antibiotics that are, are going to be a little different if somebody is um, allergic to penicillin. Doesn't mean you can't have treatment for gonorrhea. If you're allergic to penicillin, there are other antibiotics available to people who have allergic reactions to penicillin. Um, the next one is syphilis. Syphilis has several stages. So the first stage of syphilis is characterized by swollen lymph nodes and an appearance of a painless sore called a kinker that forms on, on the external genitalia. Um, this lesions of primary syphilis generally occurs two weeks after you're exposed, so it's not right away. It's about two weeks after. Um, do not f confuse this kinker with the um, word actual canker, which means ulceration of the mouth or lips. Um, this material is more of going to be used for examination for spirochetes. And so this bacteria is a spirochete, meaning it's a like a corkscrew and what it looks like underneath the microscope. It can then progress. If syphilis is left untreated, it does migrate. It is one that does not stay just in the genital area. It will migrate to the brain and it can actually alter your brain. All right, and so it's one that needs to be treated, and that's later on in its stages. The next one is chlamydial infection. This one is treatable as well, a bacterial disease that's transmitted by intimate sexual contact. It can go undetected and untreated um, because it may be asymptomatic, but it can progress to scarring and ulcerations of the epididymis in males and the fallopian tubes in females. And this can cause infertility in both males and females if it is left untreated for too long. Even with treatment, it can get rid of the infection, but the damage may already be done. Um, we then have the cankeroid. This is another STD caused by bacteria. The major characteristic here is a painful ulceration on the genitals. Like other sexual transmitted diseases that are caused by bacteria, it can be treated with antibiotics as well. And the last is the nonspecific genital infections. This would be considered the non-gonadocopal non ureteritis. This is an inflammation of the urethra. It's due to an organism other than gonococcus, so it's not gonorrhea, but it acts like gonorrhea, okay? So it's not gonorrhea, but it is something similar, all right? And so this is just an example of some of the bacterial types of STDs. So let's talk a little bit about viral. There's going to be four general types of viral STDs, and this does include acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, which is AIDS. We also have genital herpes, genital warts, and several kinds of hepatitis listed here. So let's talk about herpes genitalis or genital herpes first. This is a viral infection caused by the herpes simplex virus 2. It's also known as genital herpes. It causes painful genital blisters and ulcerations. Antiviral agents can lessen the severity and duration of the symptoms, uh, but active infection can happen during pregnancy and it can lead to a spontaneous abortion to take place, stillbirths, or congenital birth defects in the baby. Delivery of the infant's also often gonna be done through C-section so that it prevents the transfer of genital herpes from mother to baby. Genital warts, when we talk about genital warts, there is what we call a condylomia accumulation. This is going to be a major characteristic where it causes warts to kind of grow in a colony, like an area altogether. This, the person may have them then have a greater risk for genital malignancies, a type of cancer, and especially in females, it's cervical cancer. Uh, treatment to destroy the genital warts includes destruction with acid, lasers, or chirotherapy um, to kind of kill them off. Uh, but one thing to know, guys, when you have a virus infection, a virus STD, it doesn't go away. All we're doing is helping treat the symptoms. The virus stays, okay? And so it can be passed on and it can have what we call flare-ups or outbreaks. 
We then have viral hepatitis. This is an inflammatory condition of the liver caused by one of the hepatitis viruses. So this can be transmitted sexually, but it doesn't stay in the genital area. It travels to the liver and causes problems for the liver. There are several types there um, of hepatitis. We have A, B, C, D, or E. But hepatitis A and E are not considered sexually transmitted. They are a lot of times transmitted through contaminated food or water. But B, C, and D are transmitted sexually. So hepatitis B is transmitted by sexual contact, blood products, or contaminated needles. There is a hepatitis B vaccine that is available, and it is actually required a lot of times for a lot of different schools and institutions. Um, it is recommended for healthcare workers to have this because you're at a greater risk of being exposed, and, and patients don't have to tell you. Um, you would, of course, find out when you get blood tests, but you don't always have blood tests right off the bat. Hepatitis C is primarily treat, transmitted by blood products, shared needles, or she even shared straws from inhaling cocaine. Like when they use the straw to inhale the cocaine, that can also pass on hepatitis C. It's less, trans, it's less likely transmitted through sexual intercourse, but it can be. When we talk about hepatitis C, it has a high likelihood of progressing to chronic hepatitis, which is, is a cirrhosis of the liver and you would need a liver transplant or death would occur. Hepatitis D occurs only in patients who are infected with hepatitis B. So if you have hepatitis B, you have a higher chance of getting D. It's transmitted by sexual contact or needle sharing. Okay, And then of course, AIDS is on here, which is the acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. This is transmitted through the virus HIV. Um, this does start out as being asymptomatic, and a lot of times you may not test positive for HIV for almost a whole year after being infected. And so if you there is a chance you were infected, you would need to take tests at three months, six months, and at a year. If you are HIV free at a year, then you don't have HIV. By a year, you would know if you were positive. Uh, people with HIV can live for a pretty long time with this. We do have medications, but again, because it's a viral infection, there is no cure. The next group are the protozoals. We have we have trichomoniasis, which is an infection caused by uh, trichomonias vaginalis. This is a protozoa. Diagnosis of this is through microscopic examination of fresh urethra or vaginal secretions. So we get some secretions and we look at them. Uh, symptoms are going to be a frothy discharge that has a really bad odor in females. So it has like a lot of times a really fishy type smell in females. Symptoms are normally minor or even absent in males. You may not even know that they have it. A fungal infection that is a sexually transmitted disease is candidiasis. This is limited to is not limited to the genitalia. It can actually go be pretty much a fungal infection anywhere. But we do see that it causes vaginitis or inflammation of the vulva and vagina. Um, the infection is usually caused by Candidia albicans, which is a yeast type fungus. It sometimes occurs after administration of antibiotics for bacterial infections and um, or when your immunity is suppressed. And so this is an opportunistic type of infection that can occur. Uh, the fungus can be seen microscopically in urethral or vaginal secretions. It can be treated by an oral or topical type of antifungal medication. And last but not least on here, we have the parasitic group, and this would be like pubic lice, also known as like crabs. This is an external parasite or sometimes included in the STDs because they can be transmitted through sexual contact. They're transmitted by close contact with contaminated objects such as linens. They're commonly called crab lice and primarily infest the pubic region, but they can also be found in the armpits, beards, eyebrows, or eyelashes. The characteristic symptoms for pubic lice are severe itching and redness in the area. Topical agents and particular attention to hygiene are used for treating lice. Okay, and so this is just a specific type of lice. It's not head lice, it's pubic lice. All right, so we're now going to talk a little bit about the pharmaceuticals that are in this particular chapter. So we have the alpha blockers. These relax smooth muscle in the prostate, and this is to help improve urinary flow in men who are having that hyperplasia of the prostate where we've got lots of tissue that's forming there. We have the antiretrovirals. This is the type of medication used to treat HIV infections. It's a specific type. Um, of medication that helps with what we call retroviruses, which HIV is one. 
We then have aromatase inhibitors. These block the conversion of androgen hormones to estrogens to treat breast over ovarian cancer because sometimes cancers are going to thrive on the hormones that are normally present. And so these would be to stop that from happening. We have progestins. Progestins is a progesterone hormone used for contraception or hormone replacement therapy. This is usually done in combination with estrogens, and this is to help with treatment of the menstrual disorders that we saw earlier, or endometriosis, or even to help with hopefully infertility. We then have tocolytics. These suppress uterine contractions to stop premature labor, and we talked a little bit about that on a previous slide. So this would be the opposite of oxytocin. All right, last but not least here for the reproductive chapter, we have our abbreviations. Now this of course is not all of them, but this is quite a few. So we have FHR, which is for fetal heart rate. GU, which is the uh, genitourinary. So this is where we're talking about gen the genital areas with the urinary system. We see this in males. HBV, which is hepatitis B virus. HPV, which is human papillomavirus. This is the one that causes genital warts. HRT, which is hormone replacement therapy. This happens sometimes after a hysterectomy or something like that. HSG is the hysterospilignogram. Okay, so looking at the, the uh, uterus as well as the fallopian tubes. IUD, which is an interuterine device. So that's going to be an implantation to help block the uterine tubes. LMP, which is late menstrual period. PID, which is pelvic inflammatory disease. That's a complication of a lot of those STDs we talked about. RPR, which was that rapid plasid regen test. TPAL, which is term births, premature births, abortions, and living children. And so a lot of times when women go to the doctor, they're going to ask how many pregnancies have you had? How many full-term births, how many premature births, how many abortions, or how many living kids do you have? This helps us them know like how many pregnancies you've had, how many were viable, and how many weren't. We also have TUMT, which is the transurethral microwave thero thermotherapy. All right, so this is just some examples of those abbreviations. If you have any questions, please let me know. Mm -hmm.